Well, welcome and thank you all for coming tonight. And here we are in Channel Islands National Park and hopefully you recognize the four northern islands as um, photographed by Bill Dewey. And those are the four, four of the five islands that comprise the National Park as well as uh, Santa Barbara Island in the south. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with the park, here we are. The five northern ones are the park and the three southern ones belong to the Navy and the Catalina Conservancy. And a lot of, um, most people who think about the islands think about the flora and fauna that we have out there because they're highly publicized and everybody's been reading in the news about the island foxes and um, now we're looking at the island jays and trying to determine if their numbers are staying stable or diminishing. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about the human history of the island, which is um, quite lengthy. Starting with the Shumash, some 12,000 years ago, um, we have evidence of uh, Native American or uh, human presence on the islands back to some 13,000 years on Santa Rosa Island, about 9,000 or so years archeological evidence on Santa Cruz Island. And after the Europeans came sailing up the coast and dropping people off and coming back and doing settling and um, spending more time here, there were otter hunters and whalers and Aleutians coming down to, to help hunt and um, fishermen establishing fishing camps on the island. So you had a lot of influx of, of people from all parts of the world coming to the to the California coast and occupying the islands. Um, then we had the ranching era starting in the mid 1800s. And finally the um, military came and used most of the islands during the war for lookouts and um, coastal lookouts and that sort of thing. And now the park service era. So we'll talk about Santa Cruz Island today and part of the ranching history. Um, and what I want to focus on is the Italian and the French influence on the island as you see it today. And most people don't know that the ownership of Santa Cruz Island was French for almost 100 years, and or at least 50 on most of the island, and then another 50 on the east end that the Park Service acquired in the 1990s. And that person, or that French owner, was Justinian Kerr, who came to California, emigrated from Briançon, France, and came to San Francisco in, in 1851. He established a hardware business there with a partner who came across with him. And he worked in partnership with his brother, Adrian Kerr, who had a, a business in uh, Paris. So. A lot of the goods came from France to the hardware business in San Francisco. <clears throat> um, Justinian married an Italian woman, and she is on the right. Her name was Albina Molfino. He actually met her. Um, her family was from Genoa. He worked with his family's business, Justinian Carer's family actually had some business ties in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Genoa, Italy. And his wife, he met the woman who would become his wife through her brother, and later went back and married her after he'd already come to California and brought her back to San Francisco with him. So you have here the beginning of the French and Italian influence. Just to show you where Briançon is, it's in the French Alps on the far uh, eastern side of the country, almost into um, Italy. And you'll see later that there were a lot of Italian ties from Briançon because it's at a pass, one of the lower places in the Alps to go across. So throughout history, people have been coming and going through that pass. And it's much easier to have connections with Turin or Genoa from Briançon than it is to, to say have connections or business ties to Paris. And this is the family home of the Cares in Briançon. Um, it's called the Madache, and Ma means uh, farmhouse in French. So they lived out in the country outside the town. And this is a closer up view of the house. <clears throat> His hardware business in San Francisco concentrated on items that 
would assist miners. Obviously, he came in 1850, so he was part of that gold rush immigration, and he was smart enough not to go out to the gold fields, but to have a business that supplied miners and assayers and um, other types of industries or activities that were going on in the state at the time. So he um, had his business with his partner. It burned in the early years because there were always a lot of fires in these wooden cities. So when he rebuilt, he rebuilt with a metal vault and that protected a lot of his goods when the next fire came along. And by then, uh, San Francisco was starting to build in brick. And this shot on the right is uh, one of the is the storefront of his, of his business on Market Street with some of his family sitting in the top row, probably watching a parade on the 4th of July or something. And Marla Daly is here tonight. She's the president of the Santa Cruz Island Foundation, and um, she knows all things Justinian Care and <laughs> um, Santa Cruz Island. And she has managed to acquire several things that say Justinian Care Company on them, so they were either sold by or manufactured by his company. Um, you can see these types of items were probably used by assayers. They could have been used in viticulture as well, and that was starting to become established in Northern California and along the coast in the 1880s. And here's a view of the, the Central Valley Justinian Care joined a group of investors from the French Savings Bank, and there were 10 of them all together, who decided to buy the Santa Cruz Island Company, or decide, decided to buy Santa Cruz Island and form the Santa Cruz Island Company as an investment in 1869. And this is about how the Central Valley Ranch looked in 1869. This is how it looks a lot later, about 130 years later. Um, Eventually, there were a lot of things that went on in the 1870s. Um, the, the French bank director was embezzling money. He committed suicide. There were some outstanding loans on the part of the company and some of its investors. And as a, as a bank director, Justinian Care felt obligated to pay off those debts to the bank. And so he ended up with all of the shares, essentially, of the of the island company by sometime in the 1880s. So he became the sole owner of the Santa Cruz Island Company. They had bought it as an investment for wool growing. There was a, an ongoing sheep ranch on that island. It had been a Spanish or a Mexican land grant in the 1830s and two um, Mexican citizens had acquired the, the land grant, the island land grant. Um, they sold it shortly after that to William Barron who probably was the one who established the sheep ranch on the island, although it was somewhat more diversified. And they had pigs, and they had um, cattle, and they, they had a variety of activities. But when Justinian Care came, he is really the one who developed it as we see it today, with the various outranches that were in that map that I showed a bit earlier, um, developed the architecture and some of the roads and the various ranches. Um, as they look today, even though there were buildings there somewhat earlier. But he actually did not get out to the island until 1880. So if you think about the fact that he actually, he and the investors owned it for about 11 years before he even saw the island, um, they were pretty much absentee landlords. And he had a connection with Leon de Sassac, who was a French um, natural historian came over in 1878 and was exploring different places along the central coast and the central valley with a partner who was working down in Peru. So he went to various places mainly doing archaeological collections and natural history collections. Through his connections with the French community in California, he likely got to know Justinian Care in San Francisco and got permission from him to go out to the island and see what he could find out there. And he actually collected quite a bit of things um, from both Santa Cruz Island and San Miguel Island within the park, also San Nicolas Island outside the park. And he had Shumash informants that worked with him, so he actually knew what he was collecting. He wrote in some of his notes and on the items the village names or the place location names in Shumash that were given to him by his Shumash helpers. 
Um, so he spent some time on the island, collected things. They all eventually ended up in the Museum of Man in Paris and now are part of a, a collection of another museum that just got built in that collection of things moved over to the new museum. But John Johnson has been working closely through the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History to see what they've got in the French collection and determine um, if, he can hold, if he can borrow some of that to have an, a traveling exhibition of the Sasak items here in the United States. So hopefully that'll happen in the next few years and it'll be very exciting to see some of that. And some of the Shumash people from the reservation have been over there to see what's there and they've been really excited to see some of their heritage, although they'd rather have it back here. But it's things that they've not ever seen before here in California too. So Justinian Kerr got out there finally in 1880. He took his daughter, his eldest daughter Delphine, and um, the next child down was the son Arthur. Arthur had studied surveying at UC uh, Berkeley, so he would have been a good hand to have along to really understand and maybe record some of what they were looking at out on the, on the island. And uh, what I want to mention is that um, once Justinian Kerr took over and started his own businesses and his own enterprises on the island, you can really start to see that European influence between his French heritage and his wife's Italian heritage and their business connections both in France and in Italy. Almost all of the island employees were Italian from the 1880s, probably up through about after the turn of the century, probably into the 19, early 1900s. And it's not until the teens that you actually start seeing more multiculturalism on the island where you have Hispanic names. Um, there was a Chinese cook at one point, but for the most part, all of the laborers on the island were Italian. It's likely that they had um, shearers and roundup people come over from the mainland, and they were probably Hispanics that itinerated from one ranch to another doing roundups and sheep shearing. So they would come over periodically or each year to do that roundup and, and shearing business. But the ones who were pretty much um, regularly employed on the island were Italian. And the record books that are in the Santa Cruz Island Foundation offices list all of these. There's an incredible amount of information. You could spend lifetimes exploring any aspect of Santa Cruz Island history that you'd like to through the collections that Marla has in her office, um, things that are at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. John Guarini, who was um, the great-great-grandson of, of Justinian Kerr, is uh, one, of, one of the owners who sold to the Park Service in about 1990, and he has his own collection of East End scorpion and smugglers um, information and maps and photographs and that. So, it's scattered around and there's tons of it because they never threw anything away. And we're the beneficiaries of all that information. Um, and these log books are, are really cool because you look through them and it tells where they came from. On uh, the, the left hand yeah. side it says yeah. there are only two that are not Italian. One's Mexican and one is from I think Santa Rosa Island. It's an Ayala so it's likely Santa Rosa Island. Um, when they were employed, when they left, how much they made, and then on the far right, it's got comments about um, bad worker, don't hire back, brought whiskey to the island, fired. <laughs> and so it's really fun to go through these and see what they said. Um, most of the laborers seemed to come from northern Italy, which was interesting, too, that um, they would have come from the north. There weren't very many. Later on, it'll say Tuscany or um, Veneto or different places in Italy, so you can see where they came from. And I have a feeling that that influence shows in the architecture and some of the, um, the specialty work that they did on the island as well. And just to give you another idea of the proximity of some of these things, you've got the Alps running through there. A is where Briançon is. So you can see how close it is to Turin. Um, Paris is way over there, so it's not close at all and Gen Genoa is down on the coast. And there were always a lot of coastal ties. And um, what we found is that there were some family connections and business connections 
that became employees of the Santa Cruz Island Company through Justinian Care. And you can see in a lot of the records um, or correspondence that, well, I'm going to send um, a cousin of mine over from, from Turin, and can you give him a job in the vineyards, or can you employ him in your office or something? And he actually, some of the, the French names that come from Briançon, we see later on the island, like Merrill, um, Joyot, and Blanchard, all worked on the island. They were all from Briançon. Some of them were married into the Care family. So there were a lot of you know, business ties, family ties, immigration ties, and they found jobs for each other in the, in the new country. Um, it's, um, Justinian Care and Albina had six children. They actually educated um, all of their children at one point in France or Italy. Delphine, the eldest daughter, went to a convent school in France outside of Paris and for, for most of her education. The boys or the younger children went to school um, outside of Genoa for a short time. She brought the family over because she wanted them to be closer to her family, learn Italian and, and get some schooling in Italy. So the boys actually got some um, trade schooling in Italy as well and then they moved back to, by then they had moved to Oakland. Um, Justinian decided that Oakland was a better place to raise his family than San Francisco. So the family essentially grew up in Oakland and kept that house for quite a long time. Some other evidences of um, the Italian heritage on Santa, Santa Cruz Island are still there that you can see. Um, on the left hand side is a sign that's hung in the dining room, the laborers dining room on the island. And it's still there, the Nature Conservancy has kept it. And it has the rules for the dining room and things that it's prohibited to do. And it's a little hard to read it because the, the letters have faded so much. But it's things like you can't scorn your soup and don't annoy your companions. Uh, don't feed the dog. <laughs> so um, they had seven different rules all published in Italian that you weren't supposed to do. And one of the longtime in employees of uh, the Care family was Pietro Olivari, who was called Pete, and um, his father had actually come over from Italy and gotten a job on the island and then brought his wife and his young son over. So when the son became eld old enough, he started working for the island company and ended up working most of his life on the island and is one of the employees that's well remembered by, by the family and shows up in lots of photographs of the island. The labor force, again, was pretty much Italian for at least the first 30 or so years. Um, they were also Catholic. They were also all men. They, there were pretty much no women on the island. Um, and the vineyards were one of the, the main enterprises of the island company. So when Justinian Care uh, started controlling the island, he planted vineyards in the 1880s. And that followed upon this um, Phloxera attack that destroyed a lot of the French and European grapevines in the 1870s. So when California was able to uh, plant wine grapes that weren't destroyed by these phloxera, then they had a, a ready market. Not so much in California, but in Europe to sell their wines. And then wine did become more popular in California starting about that time. So. Most of the Central Valley of Santa Cruz Island was planted in grapevines, and you can see them growing all the way up to the little chapel in the Central Valley. So Justinian Care, being Catholic, um, had a strong faith and wanted his island workers to have access to mass every now and then. So he built a chapel, which reminded him of, the, of his chapel in his home town of Brianzon, and had a father come over, a priest come over every now and then to give mass, and, and all of the employees were invited to come to mass. Um, they did all kinds of other work, uh, stonework, brickwork, and you can see some of the different occupations in, in the employee logs as well. The, um, a lot of the records are in French and Italian. A lot of the correspondence between the family or between the island superintendent and Justinian Care 
are in Italian or in French, depending on the manager at the time, whether it was Italian or French, but for the most part they were one or the other in the early years. Um, the drawings, there, there's a whole series of maps that were made in 1892 of the various ranches and areas of the island. They're in Italian, they're in French, some of them are in Spanish, <laughs> so you find that you can't read it very well on here, but actually most of the words on that left-hand map are in um, Italian with a few Spanish ones that were sort of part of the vocabulary all along the coast right there um, for ranching. The Matanza, the, which is the slaughterhouse, or the um, shearing shed, which is not coming to me. Tresquila, thank you. <laughs> and a lot of the other ones are, there's observatory and WC and forge, which are in English, and will and um, windmill mill and windmill, and then you've got pompa and some other words that are um, Italian. On the right, this is a drawing of the Scorpion Ranch House, which if you, you can see if you go to Scorpion, it was built in the 1880s. We actually found in um, Mary Brock, who is a great granddaughter of Justinian Kerr, um, in her records, this drawing that they made of the, of the um, Scorpion Ranch House. And if you go out there, you'll see this configuration, but there's an extra wing on the left-hand side of it, which is the bake bakery room, not showing in the plan. So that's kind of interesting that they didn't draw it to, the, to begin with. Again, um, the wine grapes were one of the major sources of income and one of the, the ways that the island workers were employed. Most of them were in the Central Valley, but there was a little vineyard out uh, at Scorpion as well on the east end. The prohibition obviously cut down what they were able to produce, um, but by then the uh, island litigation was picking up that divided the island finally in the 1930s. So there was not as much, um, the attention was focused on litigation and not so much on the island business, so the, the investment wasn't going on, but they still were producing grapes or, or wine into the 1920s, or at least until Prohibition about uh, 1917. And Kerry Stanton, after he acquired the main ranch in the Central Valley, <coughs> thought he might pick it up again, but decided it wasn't worth the time and trouble and investment to do that, so they just ended up tearing out all the grapevines. But sheep was the other main occupation, and all the sheep ran on the entire island. Um, the island was fenced into pastures, and they would conduct the roundups in the spring and the fall to shear the sheep and um, you know, decide which ones they were going to keep and which ones they were going to kill and so on, and which ones they were going to take over to the mainland and sell. So you've got the harvesters of the grapes enjoying their first fruits, and a little bit of the wine actually got bottled on the island. It was mostly Zinfandel that they grew and some other um, Italian varieties, mostly red, a little bit of white. And, but most of it was sent to the mainland, either to uh, LA or to Santa, uh, San Francisco for blending with other wines. So they sold it wholesale for the most part. But they had connections, again, in the wine industry. And what's interesting is that um, Care got to know the Rossi family. Pietro Rossi was a major investor in the, the Italian Swiss colony. So if you remember Martini and Rossi on the rocks. <laughs> and so in Asti, there was a whole colony of Italian Swiss who um, established a vineyard, had a, a, this beautiful um, Italian villa style house that the, the manager lived in. And, um, it's, it's a really, it's still there and you can see some of it if you ever go up Highway 101, try to cut over to Asti and, and see what's left of the, the early vineyard and they still have a wine tasting room and that sort of thing. But P.C. Rossi or Pietro Rossi, as an associate of Justinian Kerr, got to know his daughter Emily, one of the younger daughters, and ended up marrying her and they had quite a few children. Um, and the, the Italians um, having this strong Catholic faith, it's interesting that some of the, chil uh, the Rossi children, at least three of them, became nuns or priests, and out of the 13 or 14 that survived to adulthood. Um, the other daughter, Aglai, 
ended up marrying a, an Italian businessman who had come over, gotten a job with Justinian Care, worked both on the island and in the San Francisco office, and went back to Italy. But later, Aglai and her mother went over to Italy to stay for a while, and she got reacquainted with um, Goffredo Capuccio and ended up marrying him. So these associates became, married into the family and became part of the, both the business and the family. The architecture is another thing on Santa Cruz Island that really reflects this Italian and, and European heritage because most ranches in California aren't constructed of bricks or stone and that's what you see in most of the architecture on the ranches, um, both at Scorpion, at Christie, at the main ranch, at Prisoners, and you've got these um, rubble masonry buildings that are either faced with plaster, so you can't really tell what they're constructed of. They, they look like they're adobe, and the historic you know, um, Mexican construction would have been adobe, and that's somewhat what they look like. Um, others are faced with brick, but there's a lot of stone construction, which indicates that there was some knowledge in the island workers of how to do masonry, masonry construction. These bricks in these buildings are all island made, so they had a kiln, they um, found clay somewhere on the island, they, there was lots of lime on the island for the mortar and the limestone, so, or the mortar and the plaster. So they made the brick, they made the mortar, and they built the buildings with their island labor. These are a couple of features that are um, also fairly unique and um, not normally found on other ranches. This bake oven at Scorpion I've never seen in any other place and to some extent it resembles an or a Mexican Orno type oven but it was used for baking um, but it's raised off the ground and it has this little storage area underneath where they probably put the wood or the coals or whatever um, which they would put inside the oven, heat it up and then take out and then bake their bread in that oven and then it vented through a chimney. So it's totally enclosed inside of a room, which most outdoor ovens outdoor, um, are not enclosed in a room. And so I think this is either a French or Italian or both kind of tradition to build their, their ovens inside of a room. There's also a, an olive grove over at, uh, Smugglers on the east end of the island. And that's the only place we find the olives on the island, but they were fairly early. They've been studied a little bit by a woman from UCSB who's been looking into the historic olive groves in, this, in Santa Barbara County to determine where these olives came from. And I have an idea that these were imported from San Francisco because a lot of what was coming to the island in the 1880s and 90s was coming from Northern California and where Justinian lived not so much from Santa Barbara and the connections over here. He might have sold his sheep and sold his wine um, down in Southern California, but he was mainly bringing things over from Northern California and corresponding very closely all the way along um, with daily letters between the superintendent and the, the San Francisco office by boat and by train going back and forth. So he kept a very close hand in what was going on on the island. Um, the island construction, again, I said, is stone. There's a lot of dry stone masonry. And once you get out there and you see some of that, you start seeing it everywhere. And they built stone dams in the drainages to stem the erosion that was caused by so many sheep grazing out there. There are a lot of retaining walls, dry stone retaining walls, meaning without mortar, um, holding up the, the roads on the, the really hilly terrain. You just see piles of stone. That's some of what you see over it on the east end of, of Santa Cruz Island, these big piles of stone that they um, scooped up. Or the laborers probably got to do in the winter when there wasn't much else to do to uh, make it easier to plant or to have the cattle or sheep out on, on the range. Um, this uh, metalwork that you see on, on the building, which is probably the building at Prisoners, um, was also fairly specialized, and so there had to be craftspeople who were able to fabricate that, and you still see some of that metal that survived and been reused in different ways uh, in the main ranch. We don't have any, unfortunately, on the east end, on the Park Service property, but it's, it's 
um, there obviously was quite a bit of it used. And for the last thing I want to show you, we, um, I was able to go to Briançon and Paris a few years ago with John Johnson and Marla Daly, and we looked at the Sassat collection in Paris, which was really neat. And then Marla and I and Mary Brock, who is the great-granddaughter that I mentioned, and her son, Justy, um, all four of us went to Briançon to actually see the home of the cares. And um, I could see a lot of similarities in the architecture and some of the features in between the island and Briançon. So I just wanted to show you some of those comparisons. And you can see the styles of the building here at Scorpion and in Briançon. Oh, I wanted to show you, I just noticed this when I put the slideshow together. So if you see the eave on that left-hand one, look at the eave on the prisoner's house. It's so similar. And Smugglers has this, these nice coins, the, the projecting rocks on the uh, left-hand side corner. Again, you see those in Briançon, the limestone rocks. And the sundial on the front of the building. The ones in Briançon were a lot more elaborate than what we've got on Smugglers, but we have our south-facing Smugglers Ranch House with the little incised um, sundial on it that keeps pretty accurate time. And Justinian Kerr, I mentioned, had a, a chapel in his hometown. It, this probably was actually his family chapel that was attached to that farmstead that you saw. And the form of it is obviously very similar to what was built on the island. And he did tell his daughters that he, it, he put the chapel on the island where he put it because it reminded him of Briançon in his hometown. And the last thing is the, the bake oven. And I found a book when we were in Briançon that talked about the local architecture. And they had a photograph of a, an ancient bake oven that was very similar, um, not so much in the, in the building materials, but with the two, the storage underneath. And, the, and they were enclosed as well um, in Briançon. So it's very similar to the scorpion oven. And then the bread that was baked there also had the same sort of shape. This is a photograph on the right from Margaret Eaton's book, Diary of a Sea Captain's Wife. And it was a French baker. And those were his loaves of bread that he had baked. Um, the left is a photo from the book about Briançon. And these were the loaves of bread that got baked in these types of ovens in Briançon. So today, we're still trying to preserve this heritage and, and help people understand what the influences are um, of all kinds on the island that, as you visit it today. So when you go out there, you can think about that and look for these dry stone retaining walls and, and the kind of construction, the bake oven, that will be open and visible to the public once we get our exhibits installed in January. So we'll be having a, a big grand opening of the new visitor center on Scorpion um, soon in the new year, and hope you'll come visit that and learn more about Santa Cruz Island. Thank you.